you have a Bible with you, open it to Luke's Gospel, chapter 11. If you can, uh, you want to use your electronic version of the Bible, and you can keep from updating your Facebook page or checking Twitter while you're doing it, so that is to not live in sin, then uh, use your electronic device. If uh, you don't have a Bible with you, there are a few Bibles there, and there's a page number referenced in the program. And uh, I hope you keep a Bible open today as we look at God's Word. Now, this is the week when flags fly across the nation in anticipation of our celebration, our Independence Day. Now, while this country declared its sovereignty on July the 4th, 1776, it wouldn't really become a fully functioning republic until April the 30th, 1789, when General George Washington took the oath of office as the first president of the United States. Now, as the general walked to the balcony of the Federal Hall in New York City, you know, thousands of people jamming the street uh, gave a thunderous ovation as Washington appeared. He, he walked over, and the crowd grew quiet as he turned toward Judge Robert R. Livingston, he placed his left hand on the open Bible, sitting on a table next to him, raised his right hand, and swore to faithfully execute the office of the President of the United States. But then, you know, as the story goes, Washington did something off script. He took a turn, and he added his own words, unscripted, unexpected, I swear so help me God. And he bent over and kissed the Bible. Then Justice Livingston turned to the crowd below and cried out, Long live George Washington, President of the United States. And the crowds cheered and church bells rang. And uh, from a nearby fort, they fired cannons in salute to the new President of the United States. During this July 4th week, we want to remember why, at least some of the reason why, Washington was so grateful for divine providence. The story of our nation's birth is uh, an unlikely story. It's a, it's, a, it's a touch and go story of whether this country would survive. The first president, Washington, found himself leading a nation that was bitterly divided by this war for independence. You know, one of the things to remember is at least a fourth and possibly more of the colonists were, were loyalists, loyal to England, not interested in an independent country. And, and so what happens is there's tension throughout the war effort, and those tensions continued for years and years to come between those who were patriots, those who loyal, were loyalists, and the nation was divided. But not only was America back then divided between those two groups, but the nation was also divided about its vision for what it was supposed to be because not that many people wanted a nation. Some wanted multiple nations. The identity of the states was so much higher in so many people's view. They weren't interested in a nation, much more interested in the power and the influence and the identity related to the state in which we lived. From the beginning, it was unclear what would emerge. Now, I think of all the ways that we could describe uh, these United States of America today. I think that divided would uh, still be a pretty good way to describe our country. Uh, we hear so much about the polarization in America. And as believers, it's so easy to get sucked into those divisions and start driving down stakes uh, on uh, various positions and taking sides and taking shots at one another. Well, Jesus lived in a land divided too. Again, the Bible is so instructive. Its examples are so relevant to us today. Jesus lived in a, in a land divided. Divided by political extremists. Divided by religious extremists. 
And, and then just the complications of sinful people living in a sinful world in close proximity to one another. And there's a whole lot of difficulty that can come in those, th- in those situations. And into such a world, as, Jesus, as the disciples watched Jesus, as they watched the Savior, in all the ways that he responded to all these things, this is what they ask. Lord, teach us to pray. They saw it as his identity. They saw it as the source of his power, his wisdom. They saw it as what marked him as different from everybody else. Lord, teach us to pray. There are plenty of great people in the Bible who were people of great prayer. You got Daniel and Moses and Elijah. We read in Luke 11, that first verse, Now Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. Teach us to pray. They didn't say, Lord, teach us to pray like Moses. Teach us to pray like Daniel. Uh, From the book of a few years ago, teach us to pray like Jabez. Lord, you teach us to pray the way way you pray. They didn't ask Lord, teach us to be great teachers like you're a great teacher. Teach us to do great miracles. Teach us to walk on water. Teach us to feed multitudes. They said, teach us to pray. And they had seen in him an intense devotion to prayer. They knew it was his power. It was a recurring pattern of his life. Uh, Prayer threads its way through Jesus' life in every circumstance. Here's some examples. We'll amplify on some of these in a moment. As Jesus was baptizing, baptized by John, the Bible says in Luke 3.21, he was praying. In preparation for choosing the 12 disciples, Jesus went up on a mountain alone and spent the night in prayer. After an exhausting evening of healing the sick, many who were sick, the Bible says, casting out many demons, instead of sleeping in the next morning, it says Jesus got up early in the morning while it was still dark and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed, Mark 1.35. Jesus was praying alone when he was prompted to ask his disciples, who do men say that I am? When Jesus took Peter, James, and John up onto the mountain and Jesus was transfigured, metamorphosized before them, they they got that real glimpse of the real glory of the Savior. It's Luke in that description says, Jesus' face was changed while he was praying. Today, We're going to talk about what Jesus teaches us about prayer. We're in a series called Follow. This is your first week with us. series called Follow. We're going to follow Jesus' example. We're going to follow Jesus' teaching. So what I'd like to do today is I'd like to look at Jesus' example in prayer and then his teaching in prayer. And uh, because I gave you, I think, no blanks to fill in last week, I'm trying to remedy that today. Let's read the first four verses Take that first verse of chapter 11 in Luke again. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. That's a little different. You see some familiar words, a little different than Matthew's version that appears in the Sermon on the Mount. But on this occasion, Jesus gives an outline for prayer, a template for prayer, things to include in prayer. It's not uh, an all-inclusive teaching on prayer, like, wow, now I know everything there is to know about prayer because I read those four verses from Luke chapter 11. This is just a, a taste. The Bible is so instructive about prayer, Old and New Testament, book after book, teaching after teaching. But this this is a beginning place, and it's a good outline for thinking about prayer. This is not a, the model, I call it the model prayer. It's not a prayer to be repeated with some magical quality about it. You repeat it enough times, it all works out. Nothing wrong with repeating the model prayer, but it is teaching on prayer. And, And Jesus did a great job where many of us falter. He didn't just know about prayer. He didn't just know facts about prayer. He knew how to pray. 
He practiced what he preached. He lived out this life of prayer. And that's what makes Jesus different from us in so many different things. We elevate knowledge about anything to here. And actually doing it down here is inconsequential. When in fact, those things need to be side by side for those who are following Jesus Christ. Now, I want to share some things about Jesus' example in prayer first. And uh, this first one may be the most offensive thing I say to many of you. He prayed early in the morning. I know that's hard. It says, he prayed every morning. If we take the first chapter of Mark's gospel, and we see it multiple times in Jesus' life, as a typical day, it says, And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. Early in the morning. Man, I am not a morning guy. I've had to make myself into a morning guy. But the most important time of day to pray is early in the morning. It's not. And you can pray anytime. And, and by the way, I'm going to throw this in early in this message. For a lot of people. Oh, I pray all day. I'm firing off prayers about this and that and everything all day long. That's awesome. But if you don't spend a block of time early in the day praying, all those fired off prayers, you're asking me, 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 99% of the time. Because your heart isn't oriented toward the Lord. That's why that early morning, it sets the pace for everything else that's going to happen. A lot of, well, I, I'm just better at praying at night. Yeah, as you drift off to sleep, you're uh, snoring to the glory of God. And, and if you have a great prayer time just before you go to bed, the only time you're right with God all day is while you're asleep. So, I'm going to encourage, is that, is that an encouragement or a discouragement? I want to encur- we're going to call that encouragement. I'm going to encourage you to pray early in the day. To block some time early in your day to set all things right and set the direction right with God for the rest of the day. Morning sets the agenda for the rest of the day. It sets the pattern for life. It says this day belongs to God. In sporting events, we well, you know this is true, that the battle is won in the preparation before the competition ever takes place. And the same is true in your spiritual life. You're going to have to win that battle before you find yourself on the battlefield. And again, it's not easy for me to get up early in the morning. It's a battle every time. Here's the other reason. It's, you know why it's a battle? Because Satan does not want this to happen. This is a spiritual thing going on. He's going to oppose you in this. He's going to try to trip you up in getting this done. So it's not just, well, I'm just not much of a morning person. It's, I'm really struggling with my sin in my life. And Satan's winning the battle more often than not. And so you're going to have to do some things to make this better. You're going to have to rearrange your morning routine. You may have to get up a little earlier. You may have to set a second alarm if you're a, you have to set it across the room instead of by your bed where you can snooze, 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 snooze. You may need to have an accountability partner that's going to kick you out of bed when that alarm goes off. But how about this? You do what is necessary to prioritize what is important. Is it important? Then it becomes priority. This is one of those things, I just can't get up in the morning. And yet you bounce up every day for any variety of things. Right? That's what I'm always amazed when people say, I just can't get to church on time. Well, you get everywhere else on time. It depends on what's important in your life. Uh, this is, you're all, you're all, some of your kids, but most of your grown ups. And we have to start being grown ups when it comes to our spiritual life and taking spiritual responsibility for it in all things. And prayer is one of those areas where you just need to buck up and say, this is going to be important. Here's the second, second area. Before making important decisions, this is a big part of Jesus' life. The future of the Christian church was riding on the people he was going to choose to be his disciples. The folks he was going to set aside. And he knew in advance that one of them would betray him. He knew they would all deny him. They knew, he knew at multiple levels, at multiple times, they were going to fail him. But making the right choices for the long term was crucial. And here's what it says. In those days, it's Luke 6, in those days he went out to the mountain to pray. All night he continued in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them twelve, whom he named apostles. Humanly speaking, they were the most unlikely group of guys ever. Uh, Uneducated fishermen, freedom fighters, patriotic uh, zealots. They were, well, one of them was a traitor to his own country, a tax collector. The other was a traitor to be ambitious, impulsive, pessimistic, fallible. And yet they'd be the leaders of the church. 
that would carry forward the mission and would be described just a few years later as turning the world upside down by their influence. All that because of their faith in Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. If any of you lacks wisdom, James said, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. Major decisions always call for special times of prayer. And I want you to, to think about this. How many decisions have you ever made? And after the fact, you go to God, when it starts getting bad, when it's not going well, and you say, dear God, please bless the terrible decision I have made. Without consulting you in any shape, form, or fashion. You probably didn't include that part in the prayer, right? You just said, God, please bless my mess. God, you got to bail me out. I made a choice, and now I'm paying for it, and I want you to make it so I don't have to. Uh, wouldn't it be better just to go ahead and talk to him before you make the decision? While you're in the process of deciding? Because God has such wisdom and grace and direction available to you. With a career, with marriage and parenting, ministry, relationships, problem solving, time management, whatever it is. Jesus teaches us that decision time is always prayer time. And especially this is true in big decisions. Another time Jesus was good to pray is when under pressure... In Luke's gospel, we find this, but now even more, the report about him went abroad, talking about Jesus. Great crowds gathered to hear him and to be healed of their infirmities. And so, oh, demands on his time always. You're talking about busy, uh, pressed upon by the world. This is Jesus. And it says, but he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. But there's so much to do. There's, so, there's always one more person to be healed. There's always one more person who needs to be delivered. One more person who needs to hear a message. But there comes a point where you need to withdraw from doing to be refueled, restored, renewed for the work. Martin Luther was a 16th century reformer. He was famous for a couple of different quotes on prayer. One of them, he'd say, it was, I have so much to do today, I'll spend the first three hours in prayer. Once he said, I usually spend two hours every morning in prayer, unless it's a particularly demanding day, in which case I'll spend three hours in the morning in prayer. That the spiritual preparation is so vitally important when life is pressing in on you. But often, the schedule gets cramped, and prayer is the first thing that gets dropped in our schedules instead of the vital thing that is uncompromised. Life is draining, and... Uh, for Jesus, he's in a spiritual battle. It's not just the, the emotional drain, the physical drain. It's a spiritual drain. Jesus talks about how he realized once when power had gone out from him, doing the right thing, being in the middle of God's will, drains you spiritually. You have to be restored. You cannot restore spiritual strength just by taking a nap. You're going to need to spend time with the Lord to recharge those spiritual batteries, find renewal. And you need renewal in body, mind, and spirit. Jesus would regularly escape from people and pray. God once rebuked his people through the prophet Jeremiah with these words. My people have committed two evils. They've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and have hewn out cisterns for themselves. That's a collection uh, tank for, for water. Broken cisterns, though, that can hold no water. Listen, we, we're going to be spiritually dry, spiritually burned out, and then spiritually vulnerable to every attack of Satan, to every temptation to sin when we're empty cisterns. Only the Holy Spirit gives life, and we need His living presence constantly flowing through us, reviving and renewing. Uh, one of my favorite quotes from a guy named Taylor Smith, he said, beware of the barrenness of a busy life. Beware the barrenness of a busy life where you haven't carved out that time for God. A fourth time we see Jesus praying when concerned about others. Jesus in such tenderness and you could tell he was, he was a burden and hurting for Simon Peter. He said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Well, when it comes to one another, 
we'll criticize one another, gossip about one another, slander one another, attack and judge. But if, if we turn our concern to our Christian brothers and sisters toward prayer, if we lift them up instead of going, well, oh, they blew it. Oh, they're having a rough time of it. Oh, they, they could have done better. If we'll pray for them. Oh, the things that are possible. When we turn our criticisms into prayer, we just let this shield of faith around other people. And sometimes, sometimes I am weary, battle-worn, and I'll pray, but I need other people praying for me. Same is true for you. There are going to be seasons when you just need other people around you lifting you up in prayer. That's why one of the one another's that we focus on as a church and why you need to be in a Bible fellowship group every Sunday. A small group is so that people are praying for you and you have people that know what's going on in your life and can lift you up to the Lord and pray for you. And when you're being attacked, when, when you're weary, when you're worn, when you're vulnerable. And we pray, and this is one of the things I pray. I pray that God would encourage you when you need encouragement. I pray that God would convict you when you, when you need to turn from sin. But that pr pray for one another. In the needs of life. Keeps, keeps relationships strong. Keeps the love of God flowing between us as a church family. And keeps the devil out of our business. Here's the fifth thing. Jesus prayed when tempted. Now, Jesus challenges his disciples in this too. They face severe testing. And he says to them, the Garden of Gethsemane, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. Watch and pray. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. They're tired. They're sleepy. They're stressed. They're afraid. In the Garden of Gethsemane, they, they could have prayed and strengthened their own hearts. In their Garden of Gethsemane, they could have prayed for one another, prayed together, mutually encouraged one another in prayer, but instead they were overtaken by their fears. And they ran. They deserted. They denied we find them later on locked, huddled up behind locked doors for fear of the Jews. In contrast, so that's the disciples, because prayer was not a part of that. They, they, they slept instead of praying. You find Jesus. Jesus withstood Satan's temptation in the wilderness because he fasted and prayed. Jesus, in the Garden of Gethsemane, prayed and stayed uh, with the mission, not my will, but your will be done. You cannot resist temptation in your own strength, and you're going to need God's help, the Holy Spirit's power. How about this? When in pain, some of you in pain today, in all the different forms that pain takes in life, all the different ways that pain presses in on you, as nails were driven through Jesus' hands and feet, the physical pain, the spiritual pain of taking the sins of the world upon himself, Jesus prays, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. Prayer, prayer just directs my focus. And that's the, one of the most helpful things about prayer for me. I can focus on my pain, my hurt, my struggle. And it just gets deeper and darker and feels more broken. I focus on God and His resources and His glory and His purpose and His plan. And when I focus on that, the light shines brighter. And the weight, even in the middle of the pain, the weight doesn't seem quite so heavy anymore. <laughs> when, when I'm in pain, one of the things I, I certainly want to pray is, God, if, I, if this is to be my lot, if this is to be the road that you would have me to walk, don't let me waste this. Don't, let this be used for eternal purpose. Let this be, be something that has a, has a reason that is measurable and it touches and that ministers to others and makes me more like Jesus in every way. Seventh, at the moment of death, when death came to Jesus at the cross, one of the last things he prayed from the cross, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And the Roman centurion, an expert in death, a hard-hearted kind of person that would have this responsibility at an execution site. The Roman centurion sees how Jesus dies, hears what Jesus says, and says, surely this man was the son of God. The, 
followers who stayed close enough to the cross to record what Jesus said, to hear what Jesus said. Their lives were forever transformed by how he died and his example at the end of his life. Our whole life should be a life of prayer. And we see it modeled in Jesus. You know, Paul summed it up. He said, pray without ceasing. We pray all the time. I need a block of prayer in the morning. It's going to guide the rest of my prayer life. And when I pray in early, everything else throughout the day is much more focused, much more meaningful, much, much more Christ-like. Now, Jesus, in this model prayer in Luke chapter 11, gives us some guidelines, a template for what prayer looks like and the kinds of things to include in your prayer. And so much of our praying is just asking for, for me. God, fix this, fix this, fix this, fix this, amen, and we're done. But prayer is so much bigger and so much better than that. And at some point in your spiritual journey, it's important that you move from, you know, uh, 1 Corinthians 13. When I was a child, I did childish things. When I became a man, I gave up childish, th childish things. I grew, I became, I be I'm, I'm a different person. I pray differently now than I did when I was a child, when I was a teenager, when I was a young adult, then last year, I'm praying differently. And so we grow in our prayer, and here's six principles from Jesus and these verses. Here's the first one. When you pray, when you pray, recognize God's character. Our Father. You know, our Christian faith... Our biblical Christian faith are the only people who pray that kind of prayer. Other religions don't. You don't hear, a Muslim doesn't pray to the Father. A Buddhist doesn't pray to the Father. That's a Christian thing. It's a relationship. And it's a warmth. He's a loving, wise, caring Father. And he, his, for some people, they think of God as, a, as this unreachable, uncaring tyrant living far off on the other side of the universe... And thus prayer would be a waste of time. But Jesus said he's close and he cares for you. He's like a father. The father that we all need. The father that we all desire. The concept unique to us. And that will transform how you talk to God. Call him father. There are a lot of different ways you can address God. I'll start dear God sometimes in a prayer. I'll, but when I say father, it orients my heart in a different way it seems like when I'm praying. And most often that's how I'm going to begin. Then... We're reminded to respect God's name. Hallowed be your name. Holy is your name. Special is your name. Set apart from everything else and everyone else. Different than the creation because you're the creator. Holy is your name. It, it talks about God's character because names in the Bible always connected to their character. God's not just a loving father. He is a holy God. And he is worthy of praise. And he is powerful, exalted, wonderful. One of the things that we forget in prayer, we move to ourselves so quickly. If you'll focus on God early on, everything about you gets oriented in the right way. So start out talking about God. And think about the things about God that are just amazing. The way to compliment God. God, you're faithful. You're powerful. You are the creator. You're the redeemer. Your friend. Just, uh, and there are lists of those. And Google attributes of God and just get you a long list. I have two or three different things like that in my prayer notebook. And I'll just go and run through some of those names. And then I'll find one that just really sticks out to me on a day. And I'll spend some time just celebrating who God is. Uh, take some time. Celebrate the name of our Lord. His character. Then uh, request God's kingdom. He says, your kingdom come. And that doesn't mean, I hope the second coming is coming soon, though I will include that in prayer often. But this is to say, his reign, his rule, he's king, he's lord, he's in charge, he's the boss. I, I want him to reign over me, over my family, over my world, in my country. I want him to be first and foremost, his kingdom come. You know, in the Matthew version, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven is really, it's not a separate thing. It's, it's an amplification of your kingdom come. Because when his kingdom comes, wherever it comes, in my life, in my family, in my church, in my world, when his kingdom comes, his will's always done. 
exactly as he would have it to be done. God's kingdom is established wherever his will is done. God is king of heaven because his will is done perfectly in heaven. And I want God's kingdom to be established in my life. His will, not my will. Fourth thing, rely on God's provision. Give us each day our daily bread. There's a lot about that. First of all, it just means that for the simplest of things, you trust God. Even for my daily bread. Just that I'm going to have something to eat today. Now, we live in this weird world where we, you can go to Costco or Sam's or your favorite grocery store. and We just stockpile things. You get 70 rolls of toilet paper and you can get a 55-gallon drum of what, uh, gummy bears or whatever you need. You know, Whatever sustenance you require for your life and family. We stockpile. Uh, one, one of the reasons I like to go to a third world country on a mission trip sometimes. Because I got people praying for their daily bread. Because they really don't know where the next meal is going to come from. And it makes it much more tangible for me to spend a little time in that environment. To be reminded that Jesus lived in that kind of environment. Where you didn't know if the next meal was going to come or not. And you had to trust God even for your daily bread. But here's the other part of this. If you're praying and you're, you're relying on the Lord for daily bread, the other part, part of that is that uh, you're praying daily. You're not, you're not stockpiling prayer. Prayer does not accumulate uh, stockpiling. Yesterday, like we talked about this uh, back in the spring, early spring. Manna from heaven. What happens? They go out and gather it. And Moses tells the people, go out and gather your manna. But except on the day before the Sabbath, it's going to go bad if you try to carry over yesterday's manna for tomorrow. Same thing's true with prayer. Your prayer from yesterday, uh, you're going to need another prayer today. You can spend time with God today. And so we, we pray, give us each day our daily bread. Then reflect on God's forgiveness. Forgive us our sins. This is one of the reasons I call this a model prayer instead of the Lord's Prayer. You want the Lord's Prayer, go to John 17, the high priestly prayer that Jesus prayed. John 17 was a powerful, powerful expression of prayer. This is a model prayer. You know why? Because Jesus never sinned, so Jesus isn't going to be praying this prayer. Jesus is a sinless Son of God. So what we find here is a model of prayer. And each of us, because we have all sin, we desperately need God's forgiveness. We want to keep short accounts with God. We want, to, we want to acknowledge our sin and turn from our sin and trust in God. The greatest need we have is for, uh, is for forgiveness of sin. And Even if you've given your life to Christ, the cross of Christ has covered your sin. We want to, we want to be in right relationship to God day to day so the power of the Spirit can flow through us. So every day you spend time in confession of sin, repenting of sin, turning from, from sin that, that just distances God from you. And then, and then to forgive everyone else too. Because if you've been forgiven, you need to be a forgiver. And we tend to want God to be really gracious to us. God, forgive me. Oh, forgive me for the same thing again today. Oh, forgive me for the same thing I asked forgiveness for the last two days. Uh, God, I don't deserve it. I haven't earned it. Forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. And then with people, oh, in me carefully measured little spoonfuls, we forgive others. We hold grudges and we carry bitterness. We need to forgive as freely as we have been forgiven. And then, just to remain on God's pathway, lead us not into temptation. Well, God's not going to lead you to temptation. The, the literal meaning, and we tie this together with what Matthew said. Lead us lest we fall into temptation is uh, a good literal meaning of that verse. In Matthew, deliver us from the evil one. God's pathway doesn't lead to sin. Where does sin come from? From our own evil desires. It comes from our own heart. What we need is we need God to protect us from ourselves. Prayer helps you remain on God's pathway. Now, here's the thing about prayer. You, you, most of you have heard plenty of sermons, Bible studies, read books even about prayer. And what prayer is 
what prayer does and how to pray better. But that's not of much use to you if you don't pray. Again, it's not knowing you should that makes you a prayer warrior. It's praying that makes you a prayer warrior. It's not understanding the principles of prayer and filling in an outline on a Sunday that makes you a great person of prayer. It's getting up in the morning and offering your life to the Lord. That's prayer. And that's the power of prayer. And until we are a great people of prayer, we will not be a great world-changing people, community-changing people, family-changing people, life-changing people like God intends for us to be. And I want to challenge you by Jesus' example and by Jesus' teaching. Follow him in this great work that is ours of prayer.